We have spent a lot of time learning about quality of service, and it's great that we have intellectual information, but at the end of the day, it's only going to be valuable if we can go back to our networks and deploy QoS appropriately into them. And so, at the end of the day here, what are we supposed to do with all of this knowledge? Well, Cisco doesn't leave us hung up high and dry, right? They give us these QoS class models that will allow us to form a baseline, so to speak, give us something to start with to deploy QoS into our networks. So in this video, before we dive into the details of the class models, we need to understand what they are and what we're trying to accomplish with them, as well as how, again, we might begin to talk about deploying QoS into our networks. Let's dive in. The first thing we need to understand is that quality of service is going to look different on every single network. In other words, we can have a set of standards, and those standards are useful, except we're going to have to, on some level, customize those standards, making them fit our specific network. And that way we can apply it into our own infrastructure, and hopefully at that point, it's servicing the needs of our business. And so what are the things that we need to consider when we're, first of all, sitting down to start with maybe a blank whiteboard where we want to deploy QoS into our network? What do we need to think about? Well, the first thing we should take a look at is our applications. If you're working your way through the CL core course, then you just went through this skill called Describe QoS Requirements. We took a look at a lot of different applications that can show up inside of our network. And so the first application we need to consider is going to be our voice over IP. Because, I mean, we're in the collaboration core course, so of course that's going to be the first thing that we think about. But at the same time, in real world applications as well, voice over IP is almost why QoS exists. We have to be able to prioritize our voice over IP traffic in the network. And so the first question is, do we have voice over IP? And on what level do we have voice over IP? Are we using it in all of our locations or just some of our locations? Now, most organizations today have some form of voice over IP in the networks, but not every organization has video going across the network. So that's the next question. Do we have video that we need to consider? From there, we go down the list. We think about what are our mission critical applications? We need to identify those and figure out which of our applications belong in that category. And remember, by the way, this should be a single category. We talked about this in the last skill as well, that we don't want to get into a competition, so to speak, creating a tiered list of all of our different applications. That's not the purpose. We simply want to know which of our applications fall into this one category. And the other thing to keep in mind is that this could be a non-technical conversation, meaning that it might not be our place to sit at the table and say which application should be prioritized over another. That might be our managers. That might be the executives. And our role in IT is to make sure that we understand that when they make a decision, that our job is to implement that decision. And the good news about that is if for any reason the, the decision-making process was flawed, well, hey, that's not on us. We did what we were told to do. That's not to say we shouldn't weigh in with our opinions, but at the same time, we should absolutely respect the chain of command here. Now, throughout this course, we've also talked about these DSCP tags, otherwise known as per-hop behaviors. And so we've talked about expedited forwarding tags, which should go on our voice over IP traffic. Then we also talk about assured forwarding. I mean, we've got assured forwarding 4X and 3X and 2X and 1X. And do we need all of these tags on our network? Each one of these tags belongs to a particular application type, or at least from a standardization perspective. And so do we need that? Do we need to be marking down our packets? Does that make sense given our network design? And as part of that conversation, we need to decide, do we need a scavenger class of traffic on our network? In the real world, there's not always a need for scavenger class. And so we need to decide, do we have traffic that we can intentionally place into this category? And then also consider things like interactive traffic and bulk data and such. All of these different categories that belong to these assured forwarding values, these are where we need to decide, do we have applications that fit into every category? Now, the next thing we need to consider is the topology of our network. Because again, not every network is created the same. And so we might try to adhere to a standard like the enterprise campus architecture. That's a great standardized topology that Cisco has created. And then we talk about three-tier models and two-tier models and all kinds of different options there. And do we have layer three to the edge or layer two to the edge? But it goes beyond this as well. Do we have a wide area network? Do we have lots of different sites or just a few different sites? And are our circuits large or are they small? Are they small enough in parts of the world where we'd need to consider some of these leak efficiency mechanisms we've discussed? Furthermore, do we have a dedicated data center environment? Now we're not done yet because yeah, we know our applications and now we've identified our topology and some of the, maybe the limitations or otherwise just how it's built out. But then we also need to consider the hardware that we have used to build our network. Because first of all, is it all Cisco? <laughs> we first need to start with that conversation. Now, given that this is a Cisco course, we're going to focus on that, but we do need to understand that if it's not Cisco hardware everywhere, then we're going to have to understand the limitations and the features of that particular hardware set. 
Now, as far as our Cisco hardware is concerned, do we have traditional Cisco hardware? Do we have Catalyst 2Ks and 3Ks? Or are we built on the new Catalyst 9Ks? Certainly what Cisco wants us to build on, but we often have legacy hardware out there. And so what are the, again, features and limitations from a QoS perspective for all of these individual hardware components? And by the way, even if we are on Catalyst 9K, we probably need to understand, are we on 9200s, 9300s, 9400s, 9500s? But we need to understand the features and capabilities of each individual product family as well. Furthermore, we think about our routers. In a lot of cases, that's going to be on our wide area network. Are we built on classic ISR routers? Or hey, did we build on the new Catalyst 8Ks? And furthermore, what about what's happening inside the data center? Because if we're built on traditional 5Ks and 7Ks, and maybe even the Nexus 2Ks as fabric extenders, well, we really need to understand the quality of service capabilities on that set of hardware as well. But then we might also be built on Nexus 9000s. And those 9000s are different than the 5000s, which are different from the 7000s. And so this is where managing an end-to-end -end QoS policy can become a big challenge when we have differing hardware throughout our entire enterprise. And by the way, life gets even more exciting when we add software-defined networking solutions into the mix. For example, Cisco's software-defined access, or SDA, built on DNA Center, I mean, that would definitely affect our campus deployments. And then we have application-centric infrastructure, ACI, in the data center. And it doesn't end there because Cisco has software-defined wide area networking. So our WAN environment, our data center environment, our campus environment, our QoS deployments could all be dictated by what solution we have deployed, whether it's a traditional architecture or again, software-defined networking. So we've done a great job of drawing out all of the challenges with deploying QoS into our network infrastructures, but uh, do we have hope? <laughs> Can we deploy QoS? I mean, where do we even start? And fortunately, we have a great starting place. And that would be defining the QoS policy. Everything should start with a policy. And when I say policy, what I really mean is putting pen to paper, putting dry erase marker to whiteboard. We need to define the policy before we even think about deploying it. So that's our first step. We need to create a policy. What do we want to accomplish? What are we trying to do here? Again, we have some starting places even in the challenges that we laid out. For example, defining our mission critical applications. That would be first step, is defining which of our applications are going to need to be prioritized on some level. Now we're gonna come back to this first step in a moment, but let's just finish out our process here. So second of all, whatever we create in the first step, we are going to have to possibly customize for different parts of our network. For example, we talked about Enterprise Campus being one of our locations. Well, we might start with a policy that works great in the campus environment, but it doesn't work so great on the wide area network, or it doesn't work so great inside the data center. And furthermore, it might not work so great on different pieces of hardware. It might not work on our existing 3K switches, for example, or our existing ISRs. And so we need to consider both the network places, for example, wide area network and data center and such, and we also need to consider the hardware here. And now, once we've created our policy, we've customized it for all the different locations, well, now we are ready to create an implementation plan. At this point, we probably want a project manager. We want somebody to guide us through this implementation process. We need to plan for potentially some service outages here. And us on the technical side, we need to create all of the scripts that we're going to be using to deploy our QoS policy. And maybe we're taking advantage of network programmability, and so we're going to automate this process. Or maybe we're still going to do it traditionally, and we're going to go to the CLI, and we're going to paste all these scripts in. Now, in this particular skill, we're going to be focused on step number one here, which is the create part of our policy. We want to be able to create a policy by the end of this conversation. And we do need a starting point. And fortunately, Cisco gives us several starting points, which are called out on the CL Core Blueprint. Specifically, they are the 4-5 model, the 8 model, and the 11 model. And the 11 model is also known as the baseline model. Now, as we dive in deeper to each one of these models, we need to understand that the models are simply a starting point. They're to get us going on this conversation, to kickstart a conversation, if you will. Because we can sit there with a blank sheet of paper and just feel this all feels overwhelming, right? How do we even start to go down this path? And this is exactly what Cisco is trying to give us with these models. Give us a starting point. Give us a place to begin our journey. And so from here, we're going to start taking a look at these models and figuring out how exactly we can start to apply them into our networks. So let's remember how we started, which is that QoS is going to look very different on all of our networks. We need to understand that we can't just take a standardization and apply it to every single network that we're in charge of. And so we're going to need some starting points here, and that's where we begin by defining our policy. And we talked about all the challenges. We don't want to get wrapped up in the challenges because we need to recognize that we're going to hit some of these things, but we don't want to get discouraged. We know that we've got a great starting point, 
And that starting point is going to be these different Clio S class models that Cisco has given us. So they've given us these three different models, the 4, 5, the 8, and the 11 model. We're going to be talking about them in more detail in the coming videos. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.